Welcome to this workshop on shaping the future at the International Arbitration Training and Conferences and thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. We're so grateful to the support we've received from Global Arbitration Review and Arbitral Women in putting this programme together and also to Arbitration Place and Freshfields for their incredibly valuable logistical support. Thank you all. This workshop is about shaping the future of international arbitration, but really it is about change. You've already made that change by simply deciding to come along today, so thank you for that. But it's about what we can achieve in this sphere. And I really hope that at the end of today, you will understand better and go away with a clear pathway towards sustainable change in your practices. I'm very much put in mind uh, when I think about what we need to do in this space. I'm very much put in mind of that wonderful quote from Margaret Mead, who won the Planetary Citizen of the Year Award, I think back in 1978. And she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I would have to say that I don't think anyone could argue that the international arbitration community is not thoughtful and committed. And when I look back at what the campaign for greener arbitrations was at the very beginning, when it was really just a very short blog post leading to the Green Pledge, um, and when I look at what it has developed into in the past three years, I feel hugely inspired inspired to believe that we can achieve real change in our industry. And of course, during the pandemic, we have all had change thrust upon us. But it is really up to us now as to the choices we make regarding how we build on those changes we've had to make and how we make sure that they are the ones we should be making as we look towards the future. We cannot, in all conscience, revert to our former wasteful ways. We all know how wasteful the practice of international arbitration could be. You don't need me to hit you with data and statistics. You don't need to make me to talk about the tons of carbon that each arbitration emitted. Yes, I can tell you about where that carbon comes from, the long haul flights, the mountains of bundles, the unnecessary travel to the unnecessary meetings. But I think deep down, we all knew how wasteful our practices were. And we all just thought it was someone else's problem. But now we are in a climate emergency. There is no doubt about that. And it is our problem. And so I want us to, and I know we can, rise to the challenge of addressing climate change in our international arbitration practices. I don't want us to fall into the trap that I do see looming, which is that we spend time talking about the Green Pledge at conferences, we spend time arguing, we are lawyers after all, but arguing about whether a high value arbitration has a higher carbon footprint than a lower value dispute and, and so on. We don't have the luxury of that time. The North American Subcommittee has put together a phenomenal programme for you to give you a real roadmap of what we all have to do in this space and how we can shape international arbitration training and the delivery of conferences so that it is fit for purpose for the future. I'm thinking of the future, I'm very much minded by JFK who said, those that look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future and really that is what it is all about today. So today we are very excited to be working with you all to shape a greener future for international arbitration. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, greetings and thank you for having me at your uh, your conference. Uh, Barry uh, asked me to speak a little bit about strategy, um, and if I can have the organizers put up the uh, first slide. I have only three slides. I promise you, it won't be much. Um, to say what is a strategy? Perfect. So strategy is choice. 
Uh, and here are the choices that uh, I find in, in strategy that helps any organization, whether it's your overall organization or any one of the organizations represented by people in this, are more successful if they make this set of five choices. They have an aspiration, a winning aspiration. They make a clear decision on where to play and where not to play. And in that place, how they win, then what capabilities are necessary to win, uh, where they've chosen to play to meet their winning aspiration, and then what and management systems help build and maintain those capabilities to help them win where they've chosen to play to meet their winning uh, aspiration. The key is being choiceful and having all of these choices fit together and reinforce uh, each other. The absolute heart of strategy, next slide, is the where to play, how to win combination, where you decide where you're going to play and how you're going to be better than anybody else in that space. Competition doesn't have to be brutal, right? It only is if everybody chooses the same where to play and everybody chooses the same how to win. Then it is doggy dog, zero sum. If instead all the players in a sphere, like greener arbit arbitrations, uh, pick places within it to play, it can make the world a better place and have everybody uh, succeed. But to make this slightly more concrete, I'll just use an example, next and last slide. This is the world's uh, greatest uh, luxury hotel chain. It's the largest uh, luxury hotel chain in the world, the most profitable luxury hotel chain in the world, the one with the best reputation for, uh, for guest service and the best reputation for treating its employees well. How did it become such a success story? The envy of all in the, in the industry. Well, it's by making choices and choices not to do a lot of things. So it made a choice to be the number one brand in the luxury hotel space globally. And it wanted to be the definition of luxury service. So it started out with a, with a high uh, aspiration, which is important for making a difference in the world. But then it's where to play was very narrow. And often when I tell people, oh, you should be careful and, and, and not make your where to play over broad, they, their re response is to say, well, then I'll be a small company. No, that's how you get to be a gigantic uh, organization if necessary. And in, in this case, Four Seasons is. They said, we're only going to play in hotel management. They sold off all of their hotel properties. They stopped being a hotel developer, just a hotel manager. That narrowed their focus uh, so that they could be awesome at winning there. Uh, they decided they would be in all key markets for high-end business travelers, that that would, that would be where the hotels are, and at the top of each local market. So they wouldn't have one standard, but they'd say, every market we're in, we need to be the top ho hotel. They chose to win in a different way than their competitors. And again, this is absolutely critical to strategy, picking a way to win that is distinct from your competitors. Because if you're not distinct from your competitors, you won't win. You'll create a kind of brutal uh, uh, war of, uh, of attrition and commoditization. So they said, based on founder Izzy Sharp's insight about travelers is that business uh, travelers, which now you are, you as an organization are, 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 are reducing, with, uh, but business travelers uh, don't actually want to be in luxury hotels. They want to be at home with their loved ones or at the office where they can be more productive. And so what uh, uh, Izzy Sharp said is that we are going to make our service not grand architecture and decor and obsequious service, but service to make up for what you left at home or at the uh, office. And to do that, we need to have medium-sized hotels, not the large hotels that our, that our competitors uh, uh, have. Uh, that where to play, how to win choice was utterly distinctive. It was backed by capabilities, more knowledgeable and capable staff, so that they have a recruiting process management systems that, that uh, is much more uh, selective. They plan long-term careers in an industry where careers are short, except for uh, uh, four seasons. So they have management systems that enable them to have capabilities to deliver this unique form of service in their unique style of hotel to win uh, where they've chosen to play and meet that winning aspiration of being the number one brand in the luxury hotel space and the absolute definition of, of luxury service. That, from my experience in doing strategy for many decades, 40 years, 
is the secret to success of any organization, picking a where to play, where you can be the best at it. Uh, and if you do that, what tends to happen, as is the case with Four Seasons, others choose different where to plays and different how to wins, and everybody uh, uh, prospers. The worst industries are the ones where everybody picks the same where to play and how to win. And those are the industries that commoditize and there's a race to the bottom. We want to race to the top, and that is by choosing distinctiveness in your uh, strategies. And I hope for, uh, uh, for your uh, overarching organization and, and, and all the, uh, the individual organizations the, that, that you represent, you will think next time you think about strategy of picking distinctiveness, be distinctive and win, you will make the world a better place. Thank you very much and, uh, and have a great rest of your conference. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Matthias Posch. I'm the president of International Conference Services and the immediate past president of the International Association of Professional Congress Organizers. And today I'm talking to you about rethinking meetings. Um, and I know a lot of you are attending meetings. Some of you are organizing meetings of various sizes. So I hope the data and the ideas in this presentation will be of value to you. Let's start with some data and some data points and look at how meetings have changed and how expectation has changed after the pandemic. And we see that just over 60% of meeting attendees are still unsure if they want to travel for international events. Just over 75% of large organizations, just over a thousand people, um, are actually thinking that they will organize hybrid events in the future rather than just virtual or in-person events. 95% of event organizers like my company see that we will have more hybrid events in the future. Just over 70% say the biggest challenge is networking and engagement. And I think we all have experienced that throughout this time on Zoom. And just over 80% of leadership believe that physical events are an important element to their success. So meetings are still alive and important. So how are meetings gonna be different? And one of the ways we want to look at this is start differently. We start usually with what we want to do. We want to organize a conference. We say sometimes we go into how we want to do it, say live, uh, virtual, whatever. But we need to focus more on the why. And this concept really comes down to Simon Sinek's Start With Why, which I'm sure many of you have read or heard about. So if we look in the why, the number one question is, why would somebody get on the plane, travel half around the globe to receive something that they could easily get at home with more convenience at any time they want and most likely cheaper? So for that, we need to ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? Why do we organize this meeting? What is the purpose behind this meeting? And why do our clients or our attendees attend the conference, get on the plane, and give their time where we know that time is such an important value for all of us. And it comes down to the way we design meetings and the way we organize our brain activity. Before the pandemic and throughout the virtual phase after the pandemic or during, throughout the pandemic, we've been focusing very much on the passive elements of meetings, which are these lectures, which are these frontal presentations where we sit in a dark room and look at a screen. We did done a little bit of showing, like demonstrations, um, some audiovisual elements of it. But what we need to do a lot more coming out of it and really coming back to uh, live meetings is the active part, the doing, the discussions, the practice by doing, the teaching others, because these are the elements that cannot be replicated online, but they really need to be experienced. So when we talk about content, we need to look at content with context and look at anything that is presented that's important and see, can it be discussed? Can it be going into a meet the, the expert session? Can it actually be going into a, a field trip? How, how are we actually putting our content into a context? 
and really tie it in and make it a unique experience. And that comes down to experience. Experience is really key. And don't just talk about these destination experiences um, where you go out and experience nice restaurants and the sights of a city, but it's specific and curated and exclusive experiences where you get to actually experience what the destination has to offer for your field of interest, for a professional interest as well. And it can go out and actually experience that as well. So let's maybe get out of the convention center and go out into areas of expertise in your city. And that makes it a much more immersive and interactive experience. It's not just about VR as it is here, which is a great tool as well, but immersive and interactive really means think about how it can immerse people into the destination that they made the effort of traveling to. It also comes down to networking and networking needs to be purposeful. It cannot just be receptions and dinners where people are thrown into a room and now please talk and hopefully find somebody of interest. We need to look at how can we curate this more that people meet people that they actually um, want to meet and that are of purpose to them. So this could be done through technology, there's matchmaking apps for conferences, but also by designing the meeting space in a way that we say, okay, if you work, for example, in Asia Pacific, there is the Asia Pacific uh, lounge where people can meet with that interest. There is a certain lounge and a certain topic that is of interest to many people, where people of that can meet and meet people that are like-minded or work on similar areas. So some points of consideration when we go into hybrid meetings is that we need to have a different approach for physical and virtual attendees. Hybrid is not just recording uh, a session and streaming it out into the internet and then hoping that people will be uh, attending and having a good time. We really need to think of the virtual conference separately. We need to navigate different time zones, of course, because when we deal with a, a global audience, um, that is, of course, a huge factor. If we work with sponsors, what is their return on investment? Because there's one reason for coming on site, which is the networking uh, opportunities, and the other one for being online, which has different opportunities for them. And of course, we need to manage costs. But there's also a lot of increased opportunities. The barrier to entry is reduced. We can provide accessible attendance options for all of those interested, no matter where they are, what their financial needs are. Um, we can really extend the reach of the audience for people that might not be interested enough to attend the meeting, but interested enough to check it out online. And of course, it's great for the planet if not everybody travels and increases the sustainability. So let's look at why we organize meetings and be really ready to answer that question decisively and without hesitation when our clients and our attendees ask us, why should I get on the plane? Why should I give my time to attend your meeting? Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to speak to you today. I must say I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you today and to be afforded the opportunity to share not just my personal perspective on the virtues of virtual conferences and training offerings, but also Shell's corporate views as the ultimate client of arbitral services. In the short five minutes I have today, I'd like to share with you four points from my perspective that hopefully will help inspire your breakout discussions and also help you to understand what's wanted from the corporate's perspective. So my first point, this point very much echoes that of Matthias, and that's to ensure you always come back to the why. But what do I mean by that? Well, to explain, I need to take you back a few years to the dramatic oil price drops in 2016. That was the first year we in Shell Legal needed to very quickly adapt our ways of working, to find ways to quickly conserve cash, and as such, embrace the possibilities of virtual conferences. In particular, that year, we, for the first time, had to move our annual extended leadership team meetings from in-person global conferences to an online virtual offering. Just like now with the pandemic, the real reason behind making that switch, 
um, was necessitated by external considerations rather than an active purposeful choice to go online. Indeed, it was only a couple of months before the conference was due to take place that we switched from an in-person conference with all our leaders flying in from around the world to one central hub to an online offering. So as you can imagine, and I know all of you have grappled with, we had to learn a huge amount in a short time from the transition of in-person to online offerings. There were some real and perhaps obvious positives, as we all know now, particularly around cost and reducing our carbon footprint. But we also had some unexpected gains around inclusivity and diversity. For example, on the online forum, we could better manipulate who broke out into the small groups and we could invite speakers, many of our more junior members, from outside of the established leadership usual list of invitees. But as no doubt all of you have done as well, we ran up against many challenges. But the key tip that I took away from that first experience, and to be honest, which has flowed through subsequent offerings, is to recognize that you can't and you shouldn't try to replicate an in-person offering with a virtual one. Running a conference or training session online is, in my view, an art in its own right. And the best thing you can do is to come back to the basics of why. Why are you running the session? What's the purpose and the goal of your conference? And then seek to establish how you achieve that why, that purpose through a global virtual offering. My second point relates to inclusivity. Uh, many of the prior keynote speakers have discussed this point and considered how providing online conferences and trainings can promote inclusivity. Inclusivity is a point I feel particularly passionate about. Being part of a dual career couple with three small children, I know the difficulties I face with traveling to and attending conferences and training. So I can well imagine the difficulties others must face. The cost of travel from an economic time and environmental perspective can also be prohibitive and hard to justify in our now online world. So thirdly, looking at diversity. Again, it's clear that online or hybrid ways of working not only promote inclusivity, but also assist with a more diverse audience and speaker lineup. This is definitely something we've experienced at Shell when running online conferences and trainings. As a corporation, we see that it's incumbent upon us as the ultimate user of arbitral services to promote diversity across our council teams and particularly with our arbitral panels. We know only too well that bringing different voices, experiences, values and perspectives into a team makes good business sense. And we take the same approach when buying legal services. But we also appreciate that we can only help to pick a diverse panel or council team if either we're aware of or we're provided with a list of diverse candidates. We also know that many candidates are only identified from networking at conferences. We're therefore particularly keen on promoting any way in which we can open up that potentially closed off network. Making it cheaper and more accessible for everyone to attend conferences can only help with having a more diverse pool of candidates. And as they say in the well-known Broadway musical Hamilton, to be part of the conversation, you've got to be in the room where it happens. I would say that a virtual room, in many cases, creates for an easier room to enter. So fourthly and finally, from our perspective at Shell, the advantage of an online offering is simple environmental and cost economics. As Lucy's already made clear, it's evident that many of the arbitral activities we undertake have a lasting and significant environmental impact. Reducing travel is a clear way in which all of us can help to decarbonize. So whilst I appreciate there may be many challenges to doing so, and whilst it might not be appropriate in every case, given all the clear benefits in providing targeted and purposeful conferences and trainings online, I would suggest that virtual rather than in person should be the default forum. This is certainly the stance we're taking within Shell with regards to all our dispute resolution hearings, where by virtue of the virtual hearing pledge I've set up, we are setting up a, as online as our default. So in the same spirit, I'd urge all of you to really embrace the art of the possible with regards to virtual conferences and trainings. 
And always set yourself the challenge of looking to online as the default forum, unless there's an exceptional purpose, a why not to. I can't wait to hear more about what you come up with in your discussions today and also being part of your future online offerings. Thanks ever so much. It is time for us to introduce Deborah Enix Ross, our next speaker. Deborah is senior advisor to the International Dispute Resolution Group at Deborah Voice and Plimpton and a member of the firm's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Council. She is the president-elect of the American Bar Association, having previously served in many other roles throughout her long history of work for the ABA. And as with the, our other speakers, her full bio is available in the materials distributed previously. Today, Deborah will tell us briefly about the approach of the ABA to conferences and training in light of our shared goal to make arbitration events and conferences greener. Deborah. Thank you so much, uh, Dana, and to the organizers for this opportunity to speak to you about some of the ABA's uh, best practices and, and learning throughout uh, this pandemic. Um, as you know, the ABA has uh, had a lot of success with offering remote uh, programming for lawyers in all practice areas, but especially in the field of dispute resolution. Uh, and the other uh, component that I'd like to address today is the ABA's work in promoting uh, diversity and inclusion, which I know Dana uh, certainly raised at the top of this conversation. So as many of you know, the ABA has nearly 40, 40 practice related sections, divisions and forums and hundreds of committees. Um, that have offered thousands of hours of educational events throughout the years. Um, and so I'm just gonna talk about a snapshot, which would be the Center for Continuing Legal Education, the CLE, which produces a significant amount of the ABA programs. And if we look at um, the CLE for an indication of the growth of our online programming since the pandemic began uh, in the spring of 2020, before the pandemic, the ABA CLE Center had been producing about 700 live online programs a year. Uh, in 2020, that number went to 1,200 live online programs. Um, and that has been, uh, we've been drawing roughly before the pandemic, 10,000 registrants a month. Uh, in last July at the height or June of last year, we were up to 100,000 registrants uh, and that has since leveled off to about 45,000 a month. But as you can see, there's currently a, a lot of interest in online programming. That's about a 70% increase in the number of programs we offered. And then if my math is right about four and a half fold increase in the number of online registrants. So clearly, you know, we, we lawyers like statistics and that's just to indicate that live programs and, and online programming um, has been uh, increased within the ABA and um, it, that we don't see any diminishing of that. Uh, even if and when we uh, return to in-person meetings. So before I talk a little bit about our learnings and best practices, I did want to highlight some of the ABA's uh, efforts in diversity, um, especially uh, in diversity with respect to uh, ADR and, and uh, international arbitration. Uh, many will know in 2016, the ABA House of Delegates adopted a resolution that urged all providers of legal services, uh, including law firms and corporations to expand and create opportunities at all levels uh, for diverse attorneys and, and further urged clients to help facilitate those opportunities. Um, and so that original resolution 2016 did its job, we would say, because it inspired uh, various tools and strategies 
that were produced by the ABA and elsewhere to promote diversity in the profession. It also got the attention of the ABA's dispute resolution section, who then in 2018 urged adoption of a resolution uh, that providers of domestic and international dispute resolution to expand their rosters with minorities, women, people with disabilities, and people of diverse sexual orientations and genders to encourage diverse neutrals. Uh, and so that's where we find a lot of the work for the, uh, in the ABA and their, our diversity efforts in, in international arbitration. Now, turning to uh, what I would call some lessons learned or, or best practices in the pandemic, um, I would say my observations fall into four broad categories, and, and forgive me if some of this is repetitive from some of the excellent speakers that we have already heard. I will try to uh, uh, bring some uh, different perspective based on the ABA's learning, but you'll see that there is obviously some, some overlap. So the four broad categories, I would say, include logistics, uh, meeting format, outreach, and networking. Logistics, we all know, uh, you, we, they're, they're the very practical things like making sure the panelists, you schedule a practice session for them, make sure that the speakers are, are uh, logging on uh, in advance so that they can test their equipment and that they have a run of show and that there's an order and everyone knows the format. So those are the same kinds of things that you would expect um, in, uh, in outside of the virtual format, but they become critically important uh, when you're doing a virtual programming. But then there's also what I would say the meeting format. And here, I think uh, we really need to pay more attention. With, there's been talk about uh, hybrid meetings and in the ABA's experience, the hybrid meeting, uh, we conducted the ABA annual meeting, which would, took place in August. Uh, and it was a hybrid meeting, meaning that there were some folks that were participating in person and others that were participating uh, uh, virtually. And you know, it, the, you, I, I leave it to others to talk about their own experiences with it, but I would say that the cost of hybrid is really quite expensive if you want to do it properly. Um, there's the there's a hotel space and the videographers. Uh, and all of that. And I don't know that it's necessarily a great experience on either side for either participant, whether you're the in-person participant or the participant that's doing it virtually. So while I know that there is uh, increased interest in hybrid meetings, um, I would just say, just as a, as a caution, um, there are some, some, some drawbacks for it. This next point I'm making might be a bit controversial, but in terms of meeting formats, especially when we're talking about trainings and workshops, um, participants and, and whether uh, can you compel people, and I know we've, we're really at the stage now where mandates and compelling is really verboten, but having their cameras on, um, and, and that is for me, uh, something that I think we, we, we really need to think about. Uh, some of us have been um, on panels or teaching or I've, ta I've taught classes, I've done workshops where you break into small rooms and people have their cameras off and it's really very difficult to connect with people uh, and to understand what's going on with them and reading body language and all of that. Now, obviously compelling cameras to be on, you, you know, it, it is a bit drastic, but on the other hand, if it's the kind of format where you're offering a certificate or you're offering uh, some uh, um, other kind of, of um, the indication that you participated, that could be something that could, should be strongly encouraged. I think it makes for a better experience. I think having interactive uh, involvement in your meeting format is critical. So whether that's polling or 
uh, or calling on people or whatever it might be. Again, depending on whether this is a workshop, is this meant to be, is this meant to uh, uh, be the same as a massive conference, then perhaps not. But if it's meant to be an intimate uh, um, training session, then I think that these are some indicators that you may wish to consider. And then the effective use of breakout rooms. And we'll, we'll see that, uh, we'll have that opportunity uh, within this conference, within this meeting. Um, and uh, there are some, some best practices with respect to conferences and, and breakout rooms. Um, the next is outreach. Uh, and what we've noticed obviously is that with the pandemic, you have the opportunity to reach more people, to reach more diverse audience and diversity in all its form, including, let's not forget some of the younger lawyers who weren't able to travel to uh, arbitration conferences who've now been able to, to participate. There are obviously challenges across time zones, uh, but that can, that can be managed. I think we've all had the experience of having to get up in the middle of the night or early in the morning to participate based on where you live. But, but there is now the advantage of having um, the outreach and looking for new audiences, uh, especially for those who normally would not have been able to come in person. Uh, and then networking. We've heard a bit about that uh, earlier. I would just say that my own experience with the, not my own, but in the ABA's early experience, we use remote uh, meeting platforms that mimic the whole sitting at a table and mingling um, uh, that you would have at a, at a reception. Um, and while that was novel at the beginning, um, we found that people sort of tired of those kinds of social um, activities and that if you are going to have social gatherings, that it might be better to do something that's more focused. And I think we, we heard about that uh, with the previous speaker, whether it's a trivia night or uh, a, a, a different kind of activity so that there's networking with a purpose. So if the networking, if the icebreaker is something that has to do with trivia or, or, or you know, wine tasting, whatever it might be, but that is also focused so that you're in a room having that activity with people that uh, ha share the, uh, either attributes that you would, would like to meet or, or uh, people with whom you think you have something in common whether it's some substantive work or, or something of that nature. Um, and then I, I did say that there were four points, but actually there's five, there's the bonus, and that is the cost. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that um, it, it is expensive to return to in-person meetings um, and that it can have an impact on uh, uh, diverse uh, attorneys in particular, but it's also expensive to do um, the hybrid and other types of meetings. Um, just picking up on a couple of points from previous speakers, I know I'm running uh, close to my time, but I love the idea with uh, Roger Martin's point about what is your strategy, what is your niche? Uh, we all know that there are virtual conferences and trainings that are taking place every day. And if we wanted, we could sit in front of our laptops or iPads and do that with the camera off while we're doing other things and have it uh, in, in the background. That's not in the end a very satisfying experience or I don't think very sustainable. So I think it is important uh, to, as the previous speaker said, to think about what do you offer that is different and whether that's a certificate program or specialty arbitration programs, or maybe it's less focused on organizing the large conferences that we were accustomed to, and maybe thinking about smaller, more focused groups, more locally focused groups, uh, so that people don't have to travel far, but that they are uh, with a like-minded community because there is some emerging research now that indicates that people do want to gather, they want to do it safely, uh, and they want to do it in a way that is economical and, and for our purposes, uh, also greener. Uh, so with that, uh, th those are some observations, both from the ABA's uh, perspective in terms of what they've already been doing 
and uh, and and what we hope to see uh, as we emerge. And finally, I would not be a proper uh, ABA president elect if I did not say um, that the ABA certainly would welcome any of you uh, into our membership and support and our involvement in fields like dispute resolution um, so that you can help us think through some of these issues as we go forward. I look forward to uh, future conversations and thank you again for this opportunity uh, to speak with you. It's, uh, it, it's an honor to be a part of this group. Uh, I've been asked to speak for no more than five minutes on my experiences uh, running training programs uh, virtually. Uh, that experience is based upon doing multiple programs for the Charter Institute of Arbitrators, uh, both in person and virtually, uh, and also uh, multiple executive education programs at the University of Oxford and other institutions. Uh, I'm a big believer in the rule of three, so I'm gonna give three general thoughts and three takeaways. Uh, first, the general thoughts. From a purely pedagogical perspective, remote teaching is as good or perhaps even better than in-person teaching. Why? As a discussion leader, you really get to focus on the individual program participants. If you correct equipment and you're comfortable using it, you can see the responses of your audience better. Uh, participants can't hide in the back, assuming that all the cameras are on. What do you lose? Well. Clearly, and others have talked about this, you lose the networking and the development of the interpersonal relationships. The chats during the breaks, the walks to the coffee pot, to the bathroom, the social events during the program, um, those are very, very difficult to replicate and achieve the same interpersonal relationship development in the virtual world as you get in the in-person world. And the last general comment is, and this is well documented by research, and I think we've all experienced it. It's much, much harder to maintain concentration, both for the discussion leaders and for the program participants in the virtual world. So with those as my general comments, what are the three rules or best practices, if you will, that I believe are appropriate for running a virtual program? First, understand and be completely comfortable with the technology. Have the right equipment, both the camera and the microphone. Um, if you're doing a lot of these, uh, buying an external camera of high quality is relatively inexpensive, typically $100 or less. Make sure you have sufficient bandwidth. As a program leader or discussion leader, make sure you've got a quiet room. No cats walking across keyboards, children in the background, external noises. It makes it very, very difficult and distracting for participants. Know how to set up and use the breakout rooms, the screen shares, the use of videos, et cetera. Uh, and, and when I talk about familiarity with the technology, that also really means being able to help the program participants with their technology and technological, technological challenges. Can't speak today. Um, Luddites cannot exist in this new world. Uh, second rule. Understand the concentration challenges of the medium and therefore adapt your program accordingly. Uh, in the real world or in the practice, at least for me, that means you modify your, succession, your session lengths, uh, you have sufficient breaks. If possible and appropriate, you change the number of participants in the breakout rooms. Um, we found six to seven participants with one to two discussion leaders is ideal. This one is the most important one, I think. Avoid lectures and to the extent possible, make the programs as interactive as possible. Use hypothetical problems, discuss solutions, don't lecture. Have participants role play, engage every participant. Uh, and, and my last point, it, it seems obvious, and, but I can't really overstate its importance enough. Organization in a virtual environment is critical and perhaps even more critical than in the real world. Uh, in-person environment. If you're disorganized, the time while you search for what you, that file that you need or try to figure out how to do a screen share or make that video work, it just seems exaggerated in the virtual world while we just sit and wait and stare at a screen. 
Um, so what does that mean in practice? Obviously, back to the first point, be really comfortable and familiar with the technology. Uh, what I do is if there are going to be materials that are used during the program, a particular session, I send everything out in advance, typically 10 to 14 days. But immediately before that session, when I say immediately, I mean five to 10 minutes before the session starts, I send out again the materials to be used just in that session. And then when the session begins, if everybody doesn't have the material, check your email. It should be at the top of your email just sent to you. Um, if you've got multiple uh, sessions, this is a very, very effective way of making sure everybody has what they need when they need it. Uh, and then the last point in terms of organization, have very, very clear rules regarding your recordings, chats, contact information, sharing. Uh, it can be a better learning experience. I agree with what all the other participants have said. Have a good reason for determining whether you're going to have your program in person or virtual. Focus upon the goal of what your program is, and that should help drive your decision. Thank you.